wasted meat shit. Do we have your attention now, motherfuckers? You know that? Oh, I think they already pissing in their panties. Oh yeah. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mine, the home for all things horror. My name is Vic Shy, and this week, my friends, I'll be breaking down and discussing the 2016 Rob Zombie horror film, 31. I am a big Rob Zombie fan. He may not make the best horror movies out there, but I always have such a good time watching his movies. There's always a fun and campy feeling to each one of his films that I always look forward to, and 31 is no exception. When a group of traveling performers get captured on Halloween night, they must fight off against a wave of killer clowns and survive for 12 hours. This is an intense movie that I would rank right below Zombies, The Devil's Rejects. As you expect from Zombie, the film is riddled with gory kills and crazy ass characters. The best of which being Doomhead, brilliantly portrayed by actor Richard Brake. As always, thank you to everyone supporting the channel by watching my videos and subscribing. I hope to keep making content that you all enjoy. But without further ado, turn off the lights and let's talk horror movies! Our movie begins with an epic monologue from Richard Brake's character, Doomhead. He tells a pastor that he has been paid a lot of money for what he does because he is really good at it, and what he does is murder the heck out of people. The pastor pleads with Doomhead to let him and his wife Georgina go, but Doomhead tells him that his wife is with a couple of clowns he knows and that she'll be sticking around for a while. He apologizes to the pastor for not sharpening his axe beforehand and then proceeds to kill him with two whacks to the belly. We then get a montage of our group of main characters accompanied by the awesome song Walk Away by the James Gang. Rob Zombie always manages to use old 70s rock songs in his films that help set the mood perfectly. It is October 31st, 1976 and we see our main characters, a traveling group of carnies, on the road in their van. Our traveling band of misfits consists of Fat Randy, Roscoe, Panda, Venus, Levon, and Charlie, played by Zombie's wife herself, Cherry Moon Zombie. The group is accompanied by two new girls, Snoopy and Trixie. All the characters engage in conversations with dialogue that you'd expect from a Rob Zombie film. You all got a gorilla? Yeah, I got a fucking gorilla. He's in my pants at Calm King Dong. They stop at a gas station and get some of the best customer service I've ever seen. Got any gas today? It's a cock-sucking gas station, ain't it? We see a woman seemingly come out of nowhere who begins flirting with Roscoe. She asks him about hunting several times and Roscoe tells her that they don't have any guns. The woman then walks off from the seemingly random interaction. It is now nighttime and the group is back on the road. Fat Randy suddenly stops the van as we see several scarecrows blocking the road. Roscoe, Panda, and Snoopy get out of the van to try and move the scarecrows, but are suddenly ambushed by a group of men all wearing face paint. Snoopy automatically gets stabbed and killed, and we see the group of armed suspects overtake the van. The group get taken hostage, and we see the dead bodies of Fat Randy and Trixie, who were killed off screen. This was a really messy scene with a bunch of shaky cam and unnecessary cuts that make it really hard to see what's going on. For a Rob Zombie movie, it cuts away from a lot of the violence and kills, and this happens a lot throughout the movie, which is one of the film's biggest flaws. The group are then held captive in chains in what appears to be an old Victorian theater. Their host is none other than Malcolm McDowell, portraying a character known as Father Murder, who is joined by Sister Serpent and Sister Dragon. They are all dressed as old Victorian era aristocrats with powdered wigs and are wearing white face makeup. Father Murder welcomes the group to 31 and describes 31 as a warlike game in hell. Sister Dragon tells the group that all they need to do is survive for 12 hours. However, several colorful heads will be out to murder them in the most violent way possible. Each member of the group is identified as a number of 1 through 5 and are given survival odds. Levon, number 4, is given the best odds with 60 to 1, and Charlie is given the worst odds with 500 to 1. Father Murder then introduces the first killer the group will be facing off against, Sickhead. Sickhead! 
Sick Head is literally a midget dressed off as Adolf Hitler that wields two knives and speaks Spanish, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. Father Murder tells him that Sick Head lives to kill and that he will not go easy into this good night. <laughs> We see a shot of the outside location, and it appears that 31 is taking place at an abandoned factory of some kind. In true survival horror fashion, the group is separated, and each member wakes up isolated in a separate part of the factory. Each member is also given a weapon to defend themselves, and they all have 12 hours to survive. While the group wander the grounds, Sickhead's maniacal laugh can be heard echoing through the halls. Panda and Roscoe run into each other and attempt to look for the rest of the group. They hear Sickhead laughing from behind a metal door and plan to ambush him. The German words Arbeit macht frei are written on the door which translates to a German phrase that means work sets you free. These were the infamous words which were located on the entrance of the Auschwitz concentration camp. Panda and Roscoe open the door and find an entire room dedicated to Adolf Hitler, along with two dead women inside. Levon, armed with a large knife, confronts Sickhead from behind a barred gate. He tells Sickhead that he's going to kill him, and Sickhead tells Levon that number four always dies first. We see the shot of a dirty restroom with the Eye of Providence drawn of one of the stalls, possibly hinting that 31 has a connection to the Illuminati. The phrase, there ain't no god in here, is also written on several places. Charlie is hiding within one of the stalls, armed with a bat, as we hear Sickhead enter the bathroom. Sickhead finds Charlie and tries to yank her out of the stall. Levon attempts to save Charlie, but ends up getting stabbed multiple times in the shoulder. Charlie then tries to lure Sickhead away, but her plan backfires as she only manages to separate herself from an injured Levon, leaving him to face Sickhead all on his own. Charlie finds another place to hide, but is quickly located by Sickhead, who attempts to drag her out from her hiding place. Venus appears out of nowhere and whacks Sickhead in the back of the head with a bedpost with nails on it. Charlie then stabs Sickhead in his chest multiple times with his own knife, and finishes him off by smashing his head in with a bat. That again? happens off screen. Charlie really summons up her baby firefly spirit in this scene, showing that she definitely has got what it takes to survive 31. We see that Sickhead never actually finished off Levon, which seems weird to me because the killer heads were advertised as being extremely violent and that they would try to kill the group in the most violent way possible. Levon succumbs to his injuries and dies in Panda's arms in what would have been an emotional scene if we had any sort of emotional connection to the characters, which we don't. Don't. The group make their way further into the compound and come across a dinner table with what appears to be a five-star meal. They bicker amongst themselves on whether they should partake in the meal considering it may be a trap. Panda decides that he ain't fighting for his life on an empty stomach and begins to dig in along with Roscoe. Fuck it, fuck it! My stomach's so empty, you're touching me back. To the group's horror, we see that they are actually eating Levon's body parts as we see his mutilated dead body through the glass table. Panda is absolutely disgusted as we see Father Murder and the two sisters diabolically laughing at their handiwork. This scene was cool and all, but they sure did manage to cook up an entire cannibalistic buffet pretty quickly. With 9 hours left, they are read their updated survival odds and we are then introduced to arguably the film's coolest yet most generic characters. Psycho Head and Schizo Head, two chainsaw wielding clown brothers who are the very epitome of Rob Zombie esque characters. Count yourselves lucky! You got fucked by the best! The group decide to hunt the murderers down instead of hiding out and waiting to be killed. They find their way into a circus tent and hear noise coming from a sex doll laying on the ground. They discover an injured woman bleeding all over who appears to be tied down by barbed wire. Venus attempts to free her but Charlie and Roscoe believe that she is working with the clowns and that this is nothing but a trap. The woman tells the group that her name is Georgina Victor, and we discover that she is the wife of the pastor 
that died in the very beginning of the film. This means that Georgina has been trapped and tortured by the clowns for an entire year. Venus is convinced that she is a victim just like them and attempts to free her. They are suddenly ambushed by the clowns whom we see have been hiding inside of the tent the entire time. Georgina is then brutally murdered by Psycho Head as he cuts the lower half of her body with his chainsaw. A very messy fight scene ensues with a ton of unnecessary cuts that make it very difficult to tell what's going on. Venus's weapon saves the day once again as they manage to get the better of Psycho Head as he falls right on top of his own chainsaw and gets cut right in half. Schizo Head pleads for his life and tells Panda that he was forced to participate and that he does not want to be here. Panda just ain't having it with the lame ass excuse and proceeds to decapitate him with his own chainsaw. Pretty gnarly kill scene. I find it really odd that the clowns didn't manage to pull off even a single kill out of the group. Not that I wanted anyone to die, but I feel that this really went against all the hype that Father Murder built up in the beginning of the movie. With seven hours left in the game, Father Murder states that it is time to recalculate the odds and tells the sisters to open up their purses. This shows that the people in charge of 31 are a bunch Bunch of rich folks who enjoy waging their money at the expense of those they deem beneath them. I suppose you can say that Rob Zombie attempted to insert some kind of social commentary on how the rich view the poor, but it's executed pretty poorly as it isn't nearly explored enough to matter and doesn't have any sort of payoff. Both Roscoe and Panda sustain injuries from their fight with the clowns, which we see have lowered their odds at surviving. Father Murder then advises the group that Sex Head and Death Head are now on their way. Death Head is a really tall German man wearing a tutu and wielding a bat spiked with nails. Sex Head is a Harley Quinn-like woman character that wields a knife in a large chain. Panda attempts to sneak up on and ambush Death Head but is unsuccessful. A fight then ensues between Death Head and the trio of Panda, Charlie, and Venus, now wielding a chainsaw. Roscoe gets attacked by Sex Head and it is revealed that she is the woman he met at Lucky Leo's gas station. We see that she acted as a scout in the earlier scene when she questioned Roscoe about his group size and if they had any weapons. She manages to stab Roscoe multiple times with her knife before he is suddenly rescued by Charlie. During the fight, Panda gets struck in the stomach several times by Death Head's bat, killing him. Charlie then appears holding a knife to Sex Head's throat and tells Death Head to drop his weapon. He does so and begs Charlie not to hurt her. Venus picks up the bat and proceeds to kill Death Head with his own weapon. Venus asks what they should do with Sex Head and Charlie slices her throat without hesitating. So far, the group has managed to kill all of the murderous clowns with their own weapons being used against them, which I thought was pretty neat. Father Murder decides to call in Doomhead as a last resort, and the movie finally picks up to how it should have been from the beginning. Doomhead arrives at the compound dressed up as the damn Terminator, and is advised that he only has 4 hours and 37 minutes left. I can kill your whole family in that amount of time. We see him apply some white face paint in front of a mirror, and he then proceeds to punch himself in the face several times. Murder school? Oh, it's now in session. Oh yeah, this guy means business. Father Murder and Sister Serpent place a $15 million wager on their success of Doomhead, but Sister Dragon decides to opt out and fear that the group will survive. However, Father Murder says that Doomhead has never failed. Doomhead quickly gets to work and kills Venus, who went out to look for Charlie. Roscoe and Charlie discover Venus's dead body strung up on a cross and mutilated. Doomhead tells them that he will give them a moment of peace with their fallen comrade, and reveals that the doors to the outside are now open. Charlie and Roscoe get a head start and manage to make their way outside. They find a metal door to a tunnel that Roscoe believes is Charlie's best chance at escaping. Charlie refuses to leave him, but Roscoe manages to convincingly talk her into it. He then valiantly sacrifices himself so that Charlie has a chance to escape, and gets brutally murdered for his effort. Charlie manages to make her way out of the compound and tries to hide out in an abandoned house. Inside the house, she sees a small display of puppets that she initially saw at Lucky Leo's gas station. This shows that Lucky Leo was possibly involved in 31 all along, and draws in possible candidates with his gas station. 
While distracted, Charlie is suddenly knocked out by Doomhead from behind. She wakes up and is treated to one of Doomhead's monologues as he prepares to kill her. I found that the best of times happens exactly at the point we lose track of them. He begins to choke her out and tells her to look into the eyes of a true champion. He lets go of his grasp on her neck and pulls out his switchblade. He tells her that he respects her efforts, but that it's time for her to die. Sister Dragon suddenly comes on the intercom, telling everyone to put their weapons down as 31 has come to an end. Doomhead becomes infuriated, but follows the rules and leaves the house. Father Murder tells the sisters that the unthinkable has happened and that Charlie has won 31. He is asked what is going to happen to Charlie, but says that he is going to get back with them on that one. Seems like they didn't really think this one through. We see the aristocrats take off their makeup and wigs as they prepare to return to their normal everyday lives. The final scene of the movie is arguably the best ending to a Rob Zombie movie I've ever seen. We see an injured and victorious Charlie walking away on a dirt road. A van suddenly pulls up behind her as we see Doomhead exiting the vehicle. He walks up behind her in the two face off as he pulls out both of his switchblades. Doomhead was not satisfied with Charlie winning 31 and that he failed for the first time and decided decides to take matters into his own hands. Charlie doesn't say a word and accepts the fact that all she can do is try to defend herself as she balls up her fist. Doomhead cracks a smile that will from now and forever make me want Richard Brake to play Joker at some point in his career. The song Dream On by Aerosmith plays in the background and is absolutely perfect for this scene. We then get one final badass shot of Charlie as the movie ends. And that ladies and gentlemen was 31. My friends, this was by no means a perfect horror movie. This film had a lot of flaws and there were several things that annoyed me. The biggest flaw with the film is that it cut away from the gore and action way too many times, which is what most of us are here to see. However, this film was a Rob Zombie movie at its core. It had all the Rob Zombie-esque humor and characters that you'd come to expect. It also had a decent amount of good kills despite the fact that you couldn't really see some of them. I also feel that the movie took way too long to make you feel that the characters were actually being hunted and in danger. None of the bad guys aside from Doomhead ever felt threatening or that they were actually good at killing, which is a real shame because that was the whole point of the movie. The film is also carried by a brilliant performance by Richard Brake as Doomhead. I definitely wouldn't have liked the movie as much if he wasn't in it. On an initial draft of the script, the group of carnies were originally also supposed to be wearing clown makeup, which I feel would have been totally awesome and wished they would have kept that in there. Overall, 31 is a fun time that I would definitely recommend to fellow horror fans, especially if you enjoy Rob Zombie movies. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have a movie you'd like to see me break down, let me know in the comments down below. My friends, I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the Horror Mine. Y'all stick around!